All right, everyone. Hello. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. My name is Jason Levine, and I am the Principal Worldwide Evangelist for Adobe Creative Cloud. And over the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to be talking to you about Really, Creative Cloud is the ultimate post-production tool, and all of the many tools that are part of Creative Cloud, not just the applications, but also the many services that are contained therein. You can see I've got the Creative Cloud desktop open right now, featuring Adobe Stock. I'll be talking a little bit more about that in just a few moments. And actually, just before I even begin, I wanted to see how many of you are not using Creative Cloud today. You're not using Creative Cloud. OK, just a few hands. All right, so just very briefly to talk about this Creative Cloud desktop here. This is essentially your hub to access everything that's part of your Creative Cloud membership. This includes multiple things, not just all of the applications that you know and love, which of course include all of the video applications that we're showcasing here. But this also includes Illustrator, InDesign, Photoshop, of course, Dreamweaver, the newly branded Animate CC, formerly known as Flash, lots more. Even Acrobat is part of Creative Cloud. And along with that, naturally, you also have additional assets and services. So we have Creative Cloud Market, where you can get different types of illustration and vectors. You have your Creative Cloud file storage, as well as fonts. And many people who are new to Creative Cloud don't realize that we have something called Typekit. Typekit is thousands and thousands of fonts from over 150 different font families. You can search and browse, and I'm going to show you this now. Really what makes Typekit such an essential part of your Creative Cloud workflow is that the process of downloading fonts, synchronizing and beginning to use them is truly one single click to synchronize. You don't have to download anything manually. You don't have to go into font book or font folio and install fonts. Um, it's really one click and it just works. You don't even have to close the Adobe applications to begin working with them. So you might be looking for a script type font or something with sans serif and you only want to sync desktop styled fonts. You're looking for very thin and you're looking for very wide with minimal contrast and you can start to see what's available here. So we can go into something like this halogen font. It's going to show you all the various available weights You've even got your own sort of type tester to audition these. If you choose to use them, you can then show all the flavors that are available to you. You sync those selected fonts. They appear synchronized here inside your Creative Cloud desktop, and you can just start typing away. You can use them inside Premiere Pro. You can use them inside After Effects, InDesign, Photoshop, even Microsoft Word. So any application that accesses your fonts. Oh, and these are fully licensed. So licensed fonts right down to your desktop. They can be used in your own productions. They can be used in productions that you deliver to your clients. That's part of your license, part of your membership. So Typekit, huge. And you only would probably see it if you went into the asset font section of your Creative Cloud desktop. We just added about two dozen new script-styled fonts. We have a whole library of Japanese fonts that were introduced in, in November. And we're constantly expanding the offering here. OK. So we're going to dive right in because we've got about 24 minutes here. And we'll just start with a couple of highlight features. Now, one of the, as all, many of you know who are already on Creative Cloud, the promise is continuous innovation. And every NAB and IBC, kind of our two big inflection points for video and broadcast, we're always showcasing new things all the time. So what I wanted to do, sorry, I'm just pulling out my microphone. That is not a euphemism. What I wanted to do was begin with stock, which is also part of your Creative Cloud experience. And we've had stock for a little under a year now. Um, quick show of hands again, how many of you use stock video content today? Stock video content? Quite a few. All right, that's fantastic. Well, if you haven't checked out Adobe Stock yet, let me show you why this is such a smooth, slick workflow and how we are truly different from everybody else. Now, we have over 50 million pieces of content. In November, we introduced 4K to Adobe Stock. <clears throat> or I should say in January, we introduced 4K to Adobe Stock. Vectors, illustration, photography, and video. And we're going to start by bringing this searching into the web. So we've got a timeline down here. And we need to find some additional footage for this timeline that's kind of in this rainforesty kind of scenario. We've got this whole blank intro section. We've got to find some footage to fill that space. So we're going to search on rainforest 4K specifically. We can filter out only video here. And when I do that, it pulls up our search results. Again, nothing that you're probably not used to if you're already working with stock video providers. As I hover over them, it'll give you a quick preview of what that content is. If I click inside the content, now it shows you the actual dimensions, the file type, the codec that you'll be downloading, the data rate, the duration, frame rate, and of course, the actual file size. 
Now, when I showcase Premiere Pro later on, and I'll talk about our new ingest and proxy workflow that's coming to this next version, I make a point to say that the reason why we've added proxies in this new version, we've always worked natively, we still do. But the files and the footprint that they create are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We know this. The devices are getting smaller, right? We have these convertible, you know, Surface Book Pros and things of that nature that are smaller where we can actually edit this content. But 20 seconds of 4K is two gigs, right? That's 4K. You've got the red weapon over there. You can easily double that or more, which by the way, we are also offering native red weapon support already in this next version of Premiere Pro CC. So from here, I could choose to save a preview, a watermarked preview, down to any of my available Creative Cloud libraries. But I can also do that from within the application. Now, you're actually able to do this today. You can, in fact, search on video in Premiere Pro today. What's new and what's coming is the available to have that filtered search directly embedded inside of your library panel in Premiere Pro, in After Effects, and of course, you already have this in Photoshop. So once again, I could sift through all the same content here. If I actually decide that I want to save the preview from here, when I do that, the first thing it will ask me is, do you want the 1080p version or do you want the 4K version? So we grab the 4K version. I've already done that for you. Save a little bit of time here. And I'm thinking of using this piece for the start of our project, OK? Kind of this nice aerial shot. All right. So I'm going to drag this down into my timeline. Now, what I want to sort of showcase to you here is a typical stock workflow. Now, first of all, this is a 5K timeline. So our watermarked 4K needs to be resized. If you're going to work with this content, ultimately, we're trying to showcase this to the client that it's going to fit. So we need to make some changes. We need to modify this. So the first thing I'll do is just modify the actual frame size. Let's go ahead, go into our effects controls, scale this up to fit, all right? And then as I'm looking at this and looking at some of the other clips, I need to do a little bit of color correction. So I'll go into color here. I'll come back now. One of the other new features inside this next version of Premiere Pro, dozens and dozens of new preset color, color presets, color LUTs. We introduced about two dozen last time around. Now we've got the entire library of speed looks available to you. So I'm going to choose one of these here. Let's do, um, I'm looking for one called Blue Steel. And maybe we'll add a little bit of faded film kind of lower our contrast a bit, give it a little more of a film style, smooth look, increase the saturation, and let's go ahead and play this back. So I play this back, I show the client, they take a look at what we've done. You can see here we've got some other stock footage that I brought in before. I was even able to match the color from this rainforest to this rainforest pretty convincingly, and the client says, okay, I love it. Let's license this footage. Now here is where we are very different from everybody else and why you should be interested in looking into Adobe Stock. Because if I were using someone else, I would go to their site now, I would download and license the full 4K version, which is going to download, it'll download in the browser, in the background, I can keep working, and then it's done. And then I have to take that file and I have to import that file into Premiere Pro. And I have to take that file and then bring it from Premiere into the timeline. Now fortunately, Premiere Pro allows you to copy paste attributes, so you can copy and paste all the work that we've just done and replace it. Not a super big deal. But that is five steps, right? <laughs> and you had to download and be conscious of the download. And by the way, unlikely you just probably used one piece. You probably have a few pieces that you've used. So you're downloading multiple clips, and you've got to bring all of those in and do all of that work manually. How we differ is that directly from within the interface, now the location of this may change by the time we ship, which by the way will be summer or mid-2016, you'll be able to license directly from the timeline. And of course, you can also license directly from inside the library panel. When you do that, it immediately begins downloading the full resolution version of that media in the background. And when it's done, it swaps out the content with all of your effects and everything already applied. So you go from this to this instantaneously. There's no manual dragging, importing, copy, pasting, reapplying settings, adjusting in and out points, none of that. It's just done for you, OK? So this is a truly integrated workflow. Not only is this available going to be available in Premiere, but After Effects as well. It's already available in Photoshop and Illustrator today. So you'll have the same experience. And again, it doesn't matter how many pieces of content you have with any number of effects applied and masks and vignettes. You license that content, it downloads in the background, it instantly gets replaced with the full resolution media, and you're done.
It doesn't get any easier than that. Now, <clears throat> I want to show you just a couple more things here in Premiere before I move on to After Effects. So we introduced the Lumetri color panel about 10 months ago, which basically brought reimagined color workflows to the editor. If you weren't a colorist, we're going to allow you to do creative, beautiful color, very, very familiar, using familiar tools, things like Camera Raw or the Lightroom Develop module. And that's what this basic tab is, right? If these controls look familiar, we really took these from Lightroom, but reimagined them for video. And then we also gave you creative LUTs and presets for the first time. Film type adjustments, reimagined curves, three-way color wheels, and even a native vignette. But there was one thing that we were missing. That was a native white balance eyedropper. I don't know how we forgot that somehow, but we didn't have it, which meant that you still had to go back to the three-way color corrector to do basic white balancing. Well, now, of course, you asked, we listened, we have it. I can go ahead and take my white balance eyedropper, find kind of a neutral point white here, and just like that, we white balance our content. Okay, very, very simply. Now, similarly, when we introduced Lumetri, people loved it. We heard from you. You really loved this. It really did kind of change color for a lot of editors, myself included, because I'm not a colorist. But one thing that we didn't have in Lumetri was the ability to do secondary color correction. So another quick show of hands. How many of you have used or found the secondary color corrector inside the three-way color corrector in Premiere Pro? Okay. How many of you did not even know we had secondary color correction native in Premiere Pro? Right. Because unless you knew to look inside the three-way color corrector and scroll about three-quarters of the way down through all of its parameters and then twirl down secondary color, you would not have found it. You can't even search on it. If you search under effects for secondary, it will not return anything because that's not the name of the effect. The effect is three-way and it's in the three-way. And the UI was also a bit daunting, right? a bit intimidating if you weren't a colorist and how you set the key was also a little confusing. So we really wanted to simplify the process, make it intuitive, and also allow the signal to flow very intuitively. So the first thing we want to do, we're going to key the jacket and change the color of his jacket. At the top here, you'll see that we have the ability to set the key. So you can set, add, and remove in this section, or you can use one of our preset colors here. And as I grab the hue control, now I can begin the initial selection of the jacket. If I come down to the saturation control, and you'll notice, again, unlike the three-way, the moment I grab these controls, I immediately see the mask that's being generated. All right, this probably won't be my best key ever, but we'll get there. Just our final setting here. And again, I set the key. Now I want to do some slight refinement so it makes sense. You set the key, and then you refine the key. We can denoise, we can blur. Maybe we'll add a point, point 0.3 pixel blur to that. So you set, you refine, and then you correct. So if we wanted to just do a basic temperature change to this, all right, something like that. Okay. No, oh, look at that. So in the previous shot, there he is wearing the same coat. So I'd like to be able to take that same key, copy it, paste the attributes, boom. And now we've applied it there. If I scrub ahead, here's another scene. Lighting is different, but the same will apply Paste attributes, boom. Back again, right click, paste attributes. Just like that, okay? Simple, intuitive, fast, effective HSL secondaries. Now we just had a fairly sizable release in January. And here we are doing it again, more innovation again, coming very soon. The continual promise of Creative Cloud to deliver innovation all the time. And just very briefly before we go into one more Premiere feature and then bounce into After Effects, talking about presets for color. Um, under the Creative panel here, under Looks, previously we had about two dozen presets. Now you will see we have the entire collection of speed looks, as I mentioned earlier. And these are, as you saw before, very easy to apply. Make some adjustments to vibrance and saturation here. And I'd just like to show this. This feature in and of itself isn't new, but the ability just to sort of toggle on and off the effects while playback doesn't stop. So this is uninterrupted playback. This has been in since, gosh, CC or CS6. I don't even remember anymore. Um, but beautiful color presets to get you started. Lots of film stock emulations. Again, we have the entire speed look collection now as part of the creative panel inside Lumetri Color. All right. Now, the last thing I'm just going to show you here before we go to After Effects is something that everyone is probably been hearing a lot about, talking about here at the show, and that is VR. 
So VR is really the next evolution in, 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 in video and film, uh, uh, video and, and creation of video content. <clears throat> and people are already editing video, uh, <laughs> editing video in Premiere. Yes, they are. People are already editing VR content today in Premiere. The problem is, is that today, you have no way to pan around, to get inside the sphere, to really experience what the customer experience will be like, tilting, panning around in 360 degrees. Until now. So, you'll notice a couple of new buttons here in the button editor in Premiere, namely this one to toggle the VR video display. First, I'm going to go out to my flyout menu where you'll see a new setting for VR video. We're going to go ahead and adjust our settings here. And first, you need to determine the frame layout. So this particular content is monoscopic. We can choose, we also will allow you to do stereoscopic VR. Monoscopic content, let's just change our monitor view, 120 degrees here. Click OK on that. And let's enable the VR video display. And now you'll see some controls along the X and Y axis. Along the Y axis, we've got our tilt up and down inside the frame. Along the X, we have our 360 degree pan. All right, as I'm moving this around, trying to go slowly, so I'm not making anybody nauseated here. You can also just grab the wheel or actually type in coordinates here. All right, but even better, You've probably seen on the web, on, on YouTube, how they have now VR video content where you can click and drag inside the frame to pan around. Now, I'm in one quarter res playback here because the file is pretty large. But while playback is going now, you can truly experience, move, keyframe, and modify what's happening inside the frame, experiencing it just like the custom would, either on the web or with external headset or goggles, very, very easily. Okay, you've demanded it. We've already allowed some support for that. Now we have some very cool initial VR support. And if we were to export this in this version and upload it to YouTube, it has the proper metadata flags that would make this VR compatible. So right now I could take this video, export it up to YouTube, and you'd be able to click and drag around there and experience this video in 360. Pretty cool, right? Constantly evolving, constantly changing, because you're asking for it, because the industry demands it. Does that sound like sales and marketing talk? Yes. Is it true? Yes. You dig what I'm saying? All right, so let's bounce over to After Effects. Uh, oh, by the way, before I do that, I just wanted to mention one more thing about Adobe Stock. So if you haven't checked out Adobe Stock yet, please become a stock contributor. I said this earlier today, you know, I travel around the world and for the last, uh, let's see, it's 2016, so I started shooting DSLR in 2010-ish. So for the last six years, I've gone around the world, and everywhere I went, I was determined I was going to make a documentary about my travel. So we were once in Giza, you know? We were, we were in, the first time I was ever in South Africa, in a place called Sabi Sabi. The first time I was ever in Australia. All these different places we'd gone to, and I was shooting all this amazing, these landscapes, and B-roll, and animals, and creatures, and people, and life. I was determined to do all of this, and to this date, I've edited exactly zero frames of that. But what occurred to me was, hey, you know what? Maybe I can share some of this with very beautiful cameras and very beautiful lenses. I can become a contributor and actually monetize and sell my content. There is no expense to you. It is very easy to begin contributing to stock, to sell your content, to monetize your art today. 1080p, 4K. Please visit our, our uh, stock people on the other side of the booth here or go to stock.adobe.com slash contributor and become a stock contributor. Um, it's worth it. It's just worth it. Okay, so let's go over to After Effects for a moment here and talk about some of the amazing innovations that we've done here. Now, there's so much that I could talk about. First and foremost is that now, for the first time after many, many years, we have true real-time preview of audio and video from cached frames. So you'll see here we've got some synchronized sections. This is a totally new playback engine. In fact, we've taken this parts of this playback engine from Premiere and they now exist in After Effects. And for those of you who are longtime After Effects users, you know that over the last few versions, we've done a lot of work to really make the application more and more real time, to feel and function more real time, and to allow you to navigate in the application faster than you could even one version ago. So if you take a look here, and take a look at this composition, this is from a film called Waveform. What you're actually looking at here is about 10 different nested comps with some very intense, multi-keyframed rotoscoping 
lots of different cameras and lights happening here. And if I just go to the redraw here, you're going to see that things like anything with complex masking, anything that has lots and lots of layers, lots and lots of keyframes, just navigating inside the UI is so much faster than it ever was. And to kind of show you the complexity here, go ahead and make this full screen. Every time I look at this, I remind myself why I don't do rotoscoping, <laughs> because it's extremely difficult. Look at this. Now again, take the version of After Effects you're in today. Even though we have global performance cache working, we're still needing to cache frames, and I'm able to scrub through this and play through this with all of this roto, all of these advanced masks happening in real time in a matter of seconds. This is a fundamental change for After Effects. I see a lot of head shaking. Yeah, with every version, it's getting a little bit faster, a little more real time. We're replacing pieces of the engine and making that experience as fast as you can think about it, keeping you in that creative space. All right. Now, talking about it, new additions or enhanced additions. So for some time now, we've had a Cinema 4D workflow, right? A couple of years ago, we introduced a true 3D pipeline for 3D objects, leveraging our Cineware panel, bringing C4D content directly into After Effects. Well, we wanted to give you something more. So now, coming in this next version, you will have the ability to work with 3D animated text and shape layers from After Effects and C4D, having a true dynamic link between the two applications for a true 3D motion graphics pipeline. So here we have some animated text, just using standard text animation on the layer here in After Effects. I'm going to go up to my file menu and choose Export, Maxon Cinema 4D Exporter. We'll place this on the desktop. Whoops, we'll place it on the desktop and I will call this Maxon underscore T3. All right. Zzzt, like that. Now I want to preserve the look of the text, so I'm going to choose extrude here. If I wanted the text to remain editable, I would choose the text option here. Click OK on that. This is just telling me that there's a couple of 2D layers that won't be rendered out. That's fine. Let's click to a blank slate, fit the frame. Go ahead and import the one we just created, Maxon T3C4D, open this, drag it down into my composition, play it back, and now we're actually reading that C4D file. We're actually, we've already established a dynamic link with the C4D content and After Effects. But I want to do a little bit more. I want to extrude this a little bit more. Uh, I want to actually add kind of a wave, like a, like a flag, windy kind of effect to the word wave here. How do I get there? Using the standard Adobe Edit Original, Command E, it launches Cinema 4D, brings me into Cinema 4D. Here's where we are. If I go ahead and twirl down the layer here, let's first start with wave. And I'm just going to extrude this a little bit more, just be a little bit more obvious so that you can see the change in After Effects in just a moment. Twirl down form, I'll do the same over here. And as I mentioned, if we come over to our objects, let's go ahead and add some wind to this. And we'll place this on the wave text. Let me just go ahead and decrease the amplitude a little bit. And we'll increase the frequency. Play this back. OK. And now we've got some modified text there. Save it. And because of the dynamic link that we have established, when I click back over to After Effects, the changes are applied. And when I go to play this back, it happens that much faster because of all this work that we've done under the hood. Now, you're not seeing it in full quality, but this is all thanks to the multiple selection capabilities that we have in the Cineware panel with our renderer. Let's go into a final render here so you can actually see what this should look like. And now we've really got this true 3D motion graphics pipeline. Now, the truth is, when we introduced the 3D object pipeline, that's amazing. But <laughs> I, I don't know if you saw uh, the Wizards of Oz or some of the previous presentations before. They were showing some amazing 3D models. That's never going to happen for me. As Clint Eastwood once said, a good man always knows his limitations. And I know mine. But 3D animated text, yeah, I do this a lot. I do title sequences. This I can grok. This I can do. And it's faster than ever. It truly is, because the engine underneath it is faster and more efficient than ever. Importing image sequences, by the way, 10 times faster. 10. This is not marketing speak. This is QE tested 10 times faster. On average, whether you're working with DPX frames, ping sequences, TIFF sequences, Targa, doesn't matter. 10x in this next version of After Effects. Huge speed, performance, and quality enhancements. <laughs> 
I've got quick, very quick two minutes here to show you one last thing before we hand it over to Robbie Carmen. I believe he's going to show you how to work like an editor, think like a colorist. Also happy to tell you, again, everything that I know about color outside of Lumetri came from listening to Robbie Carmen. So you should pay attention. All right, the very last thing I just wanted to show you here is that we now also have the ability to export directly from Audition to the Adobe Media Encoder, and we've introduced a new panel for simple audio manipulation, audio mixing via something called the Essential Sound Panel, which truly follows the spirit of the Lumetri panel for color. So we've got a film here called Nature's Orchestra. We can send all of this content directly from the Premiere Pro timeline to Adobe Audition. It will recreate the sequence. We'll call this NO underscore day three, two. We'll send the entire sequence here, click OK on this. It will recompose and recreate the entire sequence, sending the video via dynamic link, the same kind of dynamic link that you just saw with Cinema 4D between that and After Effects from Premiere Pro to Adobe Audition. We can play back our video here. And now we have this essential sound panel, which basically breaks down all of your audio content into four different mix types. D-M-E-A, dialogue, music, sound, effects, and ambience. And when you denote the type of effect for your content, in this case, we've got some dialogue here by Bernie Krauss, who's narrating this documentary. I can say, this is all dialogue. And when I select dialogue, it now gives me a whole series of tools and effects right at my fingertips with a single slider to manipulate this audio. Everything from unifying loudness, conforming to broadcast loudness standards, measured in LUFS or LKFS. Audition understands that now. We're measuring LUFS, no longer DBFS. And the ability to repair sound, whether it's reducing noise or rumble or de-humming or de -essing. But probably the greatest one, and the one that most of you will want to use, particularly if you're novices in audio, is the ability to adjust compression and dynamics. This automatically sets and detects the thresholds for all of your audio content. And then with a single slider, will allow you to go from natural sound to focus sound. Take a listen as I do this. More than 4,500 hours and over 15,000 species in marine and terrestrial environments. And as I'm modifying this, environmental sciences that study the world it's actually we see dynamically can gain a fuller understanding from what we hear. Multiple parameters inside these various effects. The same goes for repairing sound, repairing and removing things like noise. As I am adjusting these sliders, we've gone ahead and set minimums and maximums based on these standard file types to give you the best type of sound. Now the best thing is, people in your organization who probably know how to set these different types of effects can go into our template configuration view, so that way they can actually set up and customize presets, minimums, and maximums for all of the various features that we have in here. You can send these presets to other people in your organization so that they'll have the same parameters, the same delivery, the same broadcast loudness measurement settings ahead of time for consistency across the board. When you're done exporting, previously you used to have to go back to Adobe Premiere Pro, but you don't anymore. This is now a true finishing audio workflow because directly from Adobe Audition, you can go to File, Export, Export with Adobe Media Encoder, and now the Media Encoder is directly integrated into Adobe Audition. Here I've chosen, again, you can see all the various formats that you have in Premiere Pro. Everything exists here. If you choose something like MXF OP1A, which happens to be one of our smart render codecs, you can choose a preset that rewraps. So if you've got straight cuts, but you have this new audio soundtrack, it doesn't actually have to re-encode the video. It's just going to reattach the audio, which means a super much, a super much, a super faster render without any degradation to the video content. And more importantly, for people in broadcast especially, so this particular MXF flavor has 16 channels of audio. We give you instant access to a routing matrix. So for broadcasters, they say, well, I want all the program content master in channels one and two, but I want all the dialogue in three and four. You can say I've said it there. Or I can make the dialogue in 15, 16. And I want all of my student dialogue in three and four. And I want my environmental sounds in 13 and 14. You can route it here, you click OK on this, and now it sends this, non-destructively, to the Adobe Media Encoder so it can begin rendering this in the background. And again, this is the same process as if you were to send from Premiere Pro or After Effects, as well as Character Animator. So Character Animator also gets Adobe Media Encoder export in the version that's coming very, very soon. So, 
the essential sound panel to give novice and new audio users complete uh, incredible flexibility with creating professional broadcast sounding audio very quickly, AME export, Lumetri color enhancements, white balance eyedropper, HSL secondaries, a new playback engine for real-time audio sync, audio with video and after effects, a new 3D animated text, cinema 4D pipeline, and so much more. That's really just the tip of the iceberg, my friends, and that's since January, and that is the promise of Creative Cloud. Up next is Mr. Robbie Carmen, the man who taught me color. Stay for his presentation, he's amazing. Thank you so much, have a great rest of your NAB. We'll see you next time, thank you.